Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Resurrection Day. This morning, uh, my habit is normally I, I get up. <laughs> normally I get up and uh, drink a cup of coffee and turn the news on. You know, whether I want to see what the news is or not, it's just a, a habit that I've done forever. And this morning, you know, the newscaster said, well, happy Easter, everyone. So I bet there was a bunch of chocolate bunnies eaten this morning. And then I bet there was some uh, Easter eggs. And it'd be a great day to have Easter eggs. And, and, and he went on and on about, you know, Easter, but not once did he mention the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, you know, you think about it, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest event in all of human history. I mean, there, there's nothing that even compares to that. And yet, our world kind of just looks at it and, and passes it by. And so, this morning, you know, I don't know if I'm, I'm apologizing or not, but uh, we're only going to cover the first two verses of chapter 2. And the reason for that is really... The first two verses kind of go along with what we were studying last week, uh, 5 through 10. And I just couldn't figure out how to put it all together that quick. Um, I'm still trying to get my my rhythm down where I, I know how much I, time i got to talk and how long my stories are going to last and things like that. And, and so I didn't get these first two, chapter, or two, first two verses covered. And yet... If you read them, we're going to read them here in a minute. I kind of think that these two verses are probably some of the, if not the most important verses in the Bible. They're at least in the top ten. And uh, I know my wife says that, that I do that all the time. I say, this is my favorite verse ever. <laughs> and then the next week I go, oh yeah, but this is my favorite verse ever. <laughs> but the truth is, is that everything that you and I believe in and then we hang our hope on, is really found in these two verses. Um, and so I, I put down that they're, they're, I think they're the most important verses that we can study. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture has been given to us so that we're um, are inspired by God for information and for reproving and for a doctrine. And so I believe especially as a Christian, that every passage in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelations, from uh, Ezekiel to Leviticus, all of them have profit for us in doctrine. But obviously there are other verses and other passages that just stand out, and they, they, they become foundational passages to help us grow and, and, and define who we are. And, that, and that's what we, we have this morning. So with that, would you guys stand up with me and let's read these two verses. It's not going to take long. And then we'll open up a word of prayer and go into the study. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation of our sins. And not for ours only, but for the whole world. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to come to you and worship you this morning. We thank you that you are the great uh, Father. And we, we worship you this morning with everything we have. We're honored to be here this morning and celebrate the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the price he paid for our sins. And that he solved the problem that man has. We ask that this morning that your Holy Spirit would teach us, that you would lead us and guide us, and that you would inspire us, Lord. And we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And be seated. So, we've kind of talked about this a little bit. I'm going to be going a little bit back into what we talked about last week. But man has a problem. It's a big problem. God created you and me to have fellowship with him. For me just to think about that is kind of awesome. 
I don't know how you guys view it, but uh, I remember one time uh, a man that I really admired a lot. And uh, he was a pastor, and uh, I had kind of sat under him in a big church for quite a while. And, and all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but gradually, really, he, he all of a sudden he, he befriended me. He, he said, Dave, let's go out for coffee. And I thought, that, that's kind of special. Because he wanted that relationship with me. And so whenever I think about God wanting a relationship with me, guys, that's special. And I don't know about you, but I think we should all, you know, just kind of like, I don't want, I don't want us to go into pride because that's a sin, right? <laughs> but I mean, it, it's an awesome ideal, an awesome thought that, that God wants to walk with us. He wants to talk with us. He wants to interact with us on our daily basis. Um, and, 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 and yet there's a problem because our God is a holy God. We talked about that last week that uh, God is light and light represents purity and, and holiness and righteousness. Uh, uh, no darkness whatsoever can enter into light. You cannot turn on a little bit of darkness. All you can do is turn off the light. To make it dark. And God is holy, and yet He wants to have a relationship with us, and we are what? Well, by nature, we're darkness. We, we walk in sin. Uh, every one of us, I believe, and I know, <laughs> I don't want to point my finger, but we all have sinned, right? We've all fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3 23. I heard a cute little story about a, a young boy that's, you know, like a four or five, six-year-old, and he was just having trouble with his mom that day, you know. You know, it is a bad day where everything he did, he just clashed with his mom. And his mom grabbed him by the arm, and he sat him down on the couch and said, son, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. Well, the little boy just crossed his arms and said, I know what the Bible says. And she said, well, what does it say? And he said, all have sinned and are short. He got half of it right. All have sinned and fallen short, not are short, of God's glory. And so that's where we're all at. We're all in that same boat, no matter how good you were or how you were raised or how many times you go to church. Uh, we've all fallen short of God's glory. And yet, so we have a problem. We have a holy God over here. We have a man that they have fallen short of that through sin. Um, and so, what is the answer? Well, John has been spending the last part of the last chapter explaining to us how to deal with this problem. He's going to finish this in the first two verses, explain how it happened, right? Uh, what, our part is, is found in the first uh, John chapter 1, verse 5 through 10. God's part is in 1 and 2. Okay, and so um, again it says, and I'm going to break this down pretty in little pieces because I think they're all important. You know, I, I know, I've always liked that when I study uh, to look at every little thought and see what it matters and why God did that. Uh, you know, I believe personally that all scriptures are given by inspiration, and so that every word that's written here that John wrote, God had His finger on. God had something he was going to say and a reason of saying it. He begins with this, this phrase, my little children. That's kind of an interesting way to address a congregation, right, or, or people you're writing to. And it would be like me saying, my little children. Well, some of you guys are older than me, and, uh, and some are younger. And yet, whenever you look at, uh, even in this chapter or this book, John, I think, uses it seven times. He says, my little children. So that was a special term of endearment for him. John was a pastor. And I think that as a pastor, one of the things that, if you ever had that ambition or uh, a calling, is that you have to have this heart for the people. <laughs> There's a joke, and maybe I shouldn't tell it, among pastors. And it goes like this. I love the ministries, the people I can't stand. 
And, and, it, and it can be tough sometimes. But if you don't have a heart for the people, there's no way you can pastor them. There's no way you can minister them. You've got to love them. And, and you can see that in John's action. John has this awesome heart for these people. Also, I think we mentioned it at the beginning when we were doing the introduction, maybe. Uh, the, uh, this church that he was writing to was probably the second, third, and maybe even the fourth generation of Christians. And so a lot of these people that were getting this letter, well, they might have been John's uh, spiritual children. He may have been actively involved in leading them to, to know Christ. And so, obviously, they're my children. And uh, at, he was probably around uh, 90 years old when he wrote this. And so, I think he has a right to call them us his little children. If you're 90 and you want to call me your little children, I'll accept that. And especially if you love me that much. Cynthia and I it spent a, a year in Honduras, and we met a lot of neat people, of course, but there was two families that kind of stood out aside for us. Uh, the, the husband was, was named Yami, and uh, Gamalia, not Yami, that's a feminine name, uh, Gamalia and, uh, and Alex. They were uh, brother-in-laws. They both had married sisters, and, uh, and they both attended our church, and uh, they just became really special to me and Cynthia. Gamalia uh, spoke English, so uh, he would actually leave work to come and have and help me do something if I needed an interpreter. And he did the most of my interpretations when I preached. And so we got really close, and uh, it's been four or five years now since we've been there, or uh, we've been back, but. Uh, since that time, and um, and so now we uh, we have a habit of uh, a Facebooking, FaceTime. You know, uh, it's kind of awesome that they can live in Honduras, we can live in New Mexico, and we can push a button, and in a few seconds we're connected and we see face to face, and we talk to them. And I and I talk to Yami every so often, uh, especially if there's something major going on uh, during the. Hurricane last summer, I, I FaceTimed him and him and his family, uh, Alex and his family, he has two boys and a, and a wife, they were all huddled into Gandhi's house and they were going to uh, play out the storm, hope that you know, nothing happened. And they had a pretty good house, Gandhi has a pretty good little house and, and uh, it was a stronghold and we got to sit there and talk to him. And, and, and see what they were doing, and and you know the other things with the COVID, COVID uh, virus problem. They both caught the virus. Uh, one of our dearest friends, uh, the the pastor of our church that we were serving at, he died this year of the disease. And um, and you know so it, it's really neat to talk to them like that. Well, the other day Cynthia and I, it, I, I guess it's probably been a couple of months now. Uh, we we FaceTimed him and uh, Gammy was you know he, he gets his phone and he says there's my little girls and there's my and Alex and Alex is waving his hand and, you know and he, talking to everybody and he goes and I don't know why he brought this up but he said David you're like you know we're like your little children you know and you're you're kind of a you know our father in the Lord uh, they're probably in their mid. 30s now, maybe maybe 38 on my high side. I'm in my 60s, and and you know I'm their little, I'm their father, and they're their my little children. And you know what, guys? That made me feel really special. That they would look at me from way off in America and think they're our spiritual father. And as I was thinking about that, the more I thought about that, I thought you know that's a great experience for me. And I would wish that for every one of us here. That every one of us would have somebody that would look into us and say, you know, you're my spiritual mom, or you're my spiritual father, or you're my spiritual, you know, uh, disciple. And it, it really doesn't matter how old you are, how young, what sex you are, uh, how much you know about the scriptures. 
All that matters is if you care about other people. And so I want to encourage you to think about that this week. Who would be a good, and you know, be honest with you, there's, not, there's nothing good about saying, way back then, I was your father. You know, it, it's only relevant if it's today. And, and I'm in the same boat, right? Uh, moving mountain air and uh, some of my relationships have fallen away and and I would love to have some spiritual children here in Mount Mary that I could reach out to, that I could pray over, that I could counsel, that I could be friends to. And so I just want to encourage you to, to think about that. Um, and then he goes on and says, These things we write to you so that you may not sin. If you remember when we started this study, the things I asked you, I said, Pick out three or four things that John said, I write these things to you that you might have fellowship and joy, that you might not sin. And so the reason John wrote this letter to these people at this time is so that they won't sin. Sin really, you know, it's a sad thing. It's kind of like, a, it's a lot like a disease. You know, whenever you get a disease, something is attacking your body and, and you, you no longer feel healthy. And in this day and age, you might not have able to see your family if they put you in the hospital. And they're just, it's just bad. It's just not a good thing. Well, sin is that way too. Sin separates us from God, right? It keeps us from having that deep, intimate fellowship with each other and, and with God as well. And, you know, whenever I think about fellowship with God, I think about Adam and Eve. And, you know, here they have this beautiful garden. And uh, I don't know if you guys ever been to a bot botanic garden or not, where they have all kinds of plants and flowers. And you just walk through there and you go, oh, wow. This is so peaceful. This is so joyful. And that's what I think of is Adam and Eve they're walking hand in hand, and God has their hand, his, their, his arm over their shoulder. And they're fellowshipping. They're talking about the day. They're talking about the flowers and the bushes and the trees and the fruits. They're just enjoying each other's presence until what? Until sin entered the garden. And at that point, they no longer had that same intimate fellowship that God desires. And so sin is a problem. Now, sin, the word in Greek, it's the same word. It would be a word that the way they describe it would be like this. You have a target, you know, round bullseye in the center, and you take an arrow and you aim it, and you, and you aim for the, the, the bullseye, right? But you're not that great, and the arrow goes to the right or to the left. Right, left, up or down, and maybe it even misses the target completely. That is what sin is. You miss the mark. You miss the target. Now, some of us, we already established that all of us miss the target, right? Uh, at times. All of us have fallen short. We've all shot that arrow at the target of God and have set aside for us and we missed it. But there's kind of, I want to say, two levels of sin. See, there's this level where, you know, you try to aim at the target, but you miss. I hope I don't embarrass Dorothy, but I was thinking, you know, obviously I have a trouble with, with overheating, right? You can acknowledge, you can say, yeah, 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 it looks like you have a trouble. And, uh, and I don't want to overeat, right? I, I, mean, I know that's not good for me. I don't think that's what God wants for my life. And yet, Dorothy brings over a dozen homemade tortillas. <laughs> and I think, okay, I'll just eat one, right? Throw a little butter on the backside of that and maybe throw it on the grill for a second. And I eat that thing and it is good. And I think, you know what? I could get away with eating one more. <laughs> 
You know, this time, I put a little butter on it, and I put a little cheese on top of that, some jalapeno peppers, and then I put another one on top of that. And I throw it in the grill. And before long, I baked way too many. I, I missed the mark, right? I, I just, I wanted to, but my weakness, my uh, faults, my natural desires took over. Then there's also the area of, of missing the mark because you see the target over there and you go, I don't care. And you let go of the arrow and you shoot the opposite direction. It's a direct act of rebellion. God says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And you say, I don't care. I'm in love with this other girl. And I intend to violate my principles and sin against God. Obviously, that has to be more serious than the other. But they both separate us from God. Um, some have talked, and, and if you study a lot, hey, can I say sure, go ahead. Give me a chance to get a sip of water, please. <laughs> well, I didn't blame you, but. sins and so all the sin is sin those sins are continually coming but it's that sin of adultery that you turn away and walk from God that you totally miss the mark and then your soul is in jeopardy but when we sin every day he continually cleanses us and it's that deliberate turning away from sin that so displeases him I can't say that you're saved or not but I would not want to be in that position yeah and, and I, I would agree with most of that. I, I do have, uh, I, I do see the difference between the two. Direct rebellion is so much worse than just missing the mark. But I also believe that even under direct rebellion, we can come before God and confess our sins, and He is faithful and just to forgive us. And uh, and whenever we kind of touched on this last week. Um, that uh, in, in verse uh, 9 of chapter 1, if we confess our sins, he is just and faithful to forgive us. Um, confession is not just saying, oh God, I'm really sorry, I, I, I got caught. You know, uh, Lord, uh, I don't want a divorce, and uh, is there some way you can take care of this problem? I believe that confession, depending on how great the sin is, uh, should be, should be, uh, have the same value as a sin, like if it's a, a, a sin like adultery, the confession has to be a broken heart, a contract heart, like David did. He said, you know, I have a contract heart before God. And whenever God brought the prophet to David and showed him his sin, I think he was broken up by it. I think he, with, with that confrontation, he began to uh, acknowledge where he, how bad he messed up. And he began to pray and wrote one of the greatest psalms we have, Psalm 51. And so uh, we, there is a difference. And we do need to, but I also believe that even the short, the little sins, the little times we miss the mark. First of all, you know, have you ever heard, if you don't uh, have something to aim at, you're going to hit it every time? Well, uh, as Christians, I think God has set the mark before us. He has shown us where we should be aiming. He's told us how to aim that direction. He, he, we try and then we miss and we, we, we ask forgiveness and confess that and we begin again the process of aiming again. And, uh, and it may take a lifetime sometimes. I, I've seen, well, not seen, but I, I've known really everybody I've known have dealt with lifelong uh, sins that just just hard to overcome. And it's different for every one of us. But God wants that because he wants that fellowship with us. It's not that he's condemning us, right? Uh, 
Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore there is no condemnation for us that are in Christ Jesus. So even if we miss the mark, God knows that we're going to miss the mark, right? It's not a surprise to him. He didn't say, oh no, David saved me. And look at that, he, he missed the mark. But uh, he, he, he made it way worse. We're going to cover that so I don't get ahead of myself. Uh, matter of fact, that's my next thing. It says, if anyone, um, if anyone sins, we have an advocate, the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And, and I like that word, if, because I don't think any of us really believe that, that there's not an if in our life. Uh, I, I don't really believe in, personally, it's, I know there are some that believe in perfection, that we come to a place where we never sin again. If that's so, I've just never been there. I've never been able to accomplish that. Uh, I, I try my best. And I desire to walk with God, but uh, it just happens. And, uh, and and you think about it for a second. What is that mark? Well, the Bible tells us to be perfect like Him. God is perfect. Well, I don't think any of us are going to hit that mark perfectly. We just aim at it. We should be aiming at perfection, at walking with God like He wants us to. But I don't think we're going to hit it. Uh, and I talked. So, so what the answer is? Well, first of all, uh, you know, John chapter one verse nine says, "If we have sinned, uh, confess that sin to God, and He will forgive you." And so, uh, confession is really just agreeing with God that what you've done, where you missed that mark, is that you didn't miss it. It's not making excuses for it. It's just saying, yeah, God, you know your, your, your standard was here. I missed it over here. And, uh, and I'm sorry, I want to move, move more to you, toward you more. And that's what confession is all about. So it says, if we do sin, well, again, you could, I, I think you're right. When we sin, excuse me, my breakfast. Uh, it, it says, if anyone sins, um, we have an advocate. Uh, I, I love this word advocate. Because in the Greek, the word advocate that is translated here is the word parakleta. And if you go through the New Testament, it's used, I think, uh, seven times. Um, no, five times. And, and four of those times, is always used to describe the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our paracletus. And here it is translated as an advocate. The word paracletus, you break Greek a lot of times into two, uh, the two words, is para means alongside. So if we, me and Cynthia are walking down the road together, uh, we're para. And the cletus means to help, to be a helper or to help Somebody. So to be a paracletus is to walk along the side and help. And of course, that's why Jesus called the Holy Spirit the paracletus in, in the New Testament or in the uh, Gospel of John, is because the Holy Spirit walks alongside of us and helps us. And, and that, that's a daily thing that we, we deal with. Um, but here it says it's a. Uh, um, it, the word is translated as an advocate. Somebody who walks alongside of you and, and advocates for you. And of course, who's he advocating to? Well, since we've sinned against God, he's advocating against or for you to the Father. You know, the scripture says that God, that Jesus Christ is now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession day and night for his people. And so he's advocating for us. Um, and so, imagine for a second. Well, maybe I wanted to read real quick, and if you guys don't mind turning to this passage, it's in Isaiah 53. Uh, because I, I thought, you know, as I read this, I thought, well, you know, uh, Isaiah 53, verse 11. But it, even in the Old Testament, the same principles 
are laid out. We don't have an Old Testament and a New Testament that are in, in option of each other. They, they both present themselves the same. Uh, verse 11, it says, And we see the labor of his soul. And I don't know if you're your Bible or not, but in my Bible, his is capitalized. That means that his is speaking of God himself. And be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant, Jesus Christ, shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall be divided, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many. And made intercession for their transgression. Isaiah, a thousand years earlier, prophesied of the very thing we're reading about this morning, right? That, that God would send his own servant, Jesus Christ, the Son, to, to pray the cross for us. So I want to I want to quickly kind of give you go through this scenario. So so say for instance you get in trouble and uh, and, and you, you have to go before the judge. And uh, and as you go before the judge, uh, the judge is asking you, you know, what what happened here? And you tell him what you did and what you're accused of. And and there's really two people involved in here, or two not people, but two uh, entities. Satan is sitting there saying, God he is guilty, and, and Satan is our accuser, right? He's accusing us of everything we ever did. And not only is he bringing up our sin, but he's saying, God, he is not worthy of your love or your grace because he did this, he did that. But then Jesus Christ stands up and he says, Father, you know me, and I know this, this, this person belongs to me, and I want, I'm advocating for him. Well, the judge looks at his son and says, son, uh, how do you plead? And Jesus Christ says, we plead guilty. He's guilty of exactly what is brought up here. He's done it. Well, the judge is a righteous judge, right? And he has to uh, be righteous because he's God. He can't be unrighteous in any way. And he says, because of your guilt, you're sentenced to death. The wages of sin is death. And then Jesus stands up and says, Father, I paid that price. I have died on the cross for his sins. I've been killed for his penalty. And the Father says, you're free to go. And that, guys, that is an awesome thought, isn't it? You and I deserve to be to die. God told Adam, when you ever you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. It's a given. He didn't say you might die, he said you will die. Sin kills us as well as separates us from God. And because of that, uh, we, we die. We die in our spirit, and we die in our flesh later on. But because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, we are now made alive. Now, the last verse here goes, he, and he himself, speaking of Jesus Christ, is the propitiation for our sins. I was just wondering, how many of you guys used that word this year, this week? He didn't say, oh, I got this propitiation thing I'm doing. It's an old type of word, and maybe if you're using something other than the King James, you may have a whole different word, but I've always liked the word propitiation because once I learned how to say it, I wanted to use it over and over again. Uh, it, it, it gave me all kinds of uh, headaches when I first started trying to preach, trying to say that word. But propitiation, it's kind of got a, a unique meaning. It, it means to appease the gods for something. And, and I don't know, 
um, the way the way I saw it, you've all seen movies where the volcano is erupting, and the natives are gathered around and they're chanting, and they grab a virgin and they throw her in the volcano to appease the volcano god. That's the idea. Something that has been done to appease the gods or the god. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that um, that I have done this. I, I, I've done, I, I became the appeasement to God for your sin. Guys, that's what Easter is. That's what Resurrection Sunday is all about. We deserve to die. Jesus Christ said, He belongs to me. And that He appeases the punishment. He pays the price. And so, it's really simple. And if you've never done it, I'm, I'm assuming most of us have, but. We acknowledge our sin. Chapter 1. We confess it before God. God, I am a sinner. I need your mercy. God is faithful to forgive us. And he cleanses us. And then we walk in that appeasement. The punishment has been paid for you and I. And I don't know Guys, I, I'm, I'm not much of a hallelujah like Manuel back there. Hallelujah! But <laughs> that is something that we should say hallelujah about, right? The, the greatest event in history is celebrated today. It's greater than the birth of Jesus Christ. It's greater than the birth of Moses. The, any president, any going to the moon, none of those things in history are as great as what takes place, what we celebrate today. The resurrection, the, well really the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because of that, we all should say hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning and we just thank you so much because you are so wonderful. Your love for us is so great that you were willing to send your only begotten Son. That if only we would come and believe in him, we could have everlasting life. And not just life, but life with you eternally. You did not come into this world to condemn the world, but that through Christ the world might be saved. And Lord, we thank you for that salvation. Lord, I pray that this week that you bring each one of us a person that we could eventually call our little children and that we could uh, pass on the things that you've taught us and the things that you let uh, grow in us and, 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 and created us <clears throat> and that we could see this town become just so on fire for Jesus and not just going to church but worshiping you the true and living God we love you, Father, and just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.